Welcome to Stories from the NNI. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Chris Ober, the Director of the Cornell Nanoscale Facility, or CNF, at Cornell University. Chris is joined by Ron Olson, Director of Operations, and Don Tennant, Director of Strategic Initiatives. Thank you so much for joining us. To get things started, can you give our listeners a little bit of history about the Cornell Nanoscale Facility? Cornell was awarded a center back in 1977. This was a big leap for NSF because prior to that, all the centers that they were managing and funding had been kind of given to them from the DOD. So Cornell won the award with the, with the great acronym NERFUS, which I believe won because of the strong interdisciplinary nature of the proposal. And I think the funding agencies at that time felt that DOD was already making a very heavy investment in electronics, so they were looking for things that were going to augment other areas. That's a good overview. It's interesting to go back and think about what was going on in the 70s. Uh, Donna's right. The National Science Foundation wanted to apply the, the tools of microelectronics manufacture for other areas. And so one of the reasons... Cornell got that is that so many other schools who were in the competition were thinking about how to make CMOS faster and better. And Cornell instead said, how can we apply these tools to so many different areas? So it's interesting, even in the 70s, people had this vision that nanoscience was going to grow and spread, but I don't think they they knew how pervasive it was going to be. So what are some of the benefits that outside users get when they come to the CNF? They come in and instantly gain access to a massive array of -of state-of-the-art equipment. So they don't have to build their own facilities or buy specialized equipment in order to try their new ideas. Supporting those instruments, we have a talented staff who have accrued over 500 years of nanofab experience. And they're here to just share their experience and their uh, expertise on the particular instruments to guide some of the research projects that people come to us with. And with the, our expert staff, we have these uh, CNF weekly tech sessions where it gives the users the confidence that their projects are feasible. And so with the tools that Don were talking about, we have over 150 nanofabrication instruments. And it's, it's definitely a low barrier to entrance. It only takes two weeks, actually, from consideration of the feasibility of the program to actual experiments in the fab. And the steps are basically got to contact the program managers, submit a proposal, and then fill out the new user application, get a purchase order, and then plan your visit for safety training, and you're in the fab the next day. And we even have an apartment, so we have a low-cost alternative for people who are going to spend time here and would find the cost of a hotel too high. The other attractive uh, mechanism that we have is full ownership of the IP that's generated, and uh, definitely a lot of respect for the privacy of the user as well. And again, the attractive picture of the uh, finances is the fees are very competitive with existing technologies in the market. And there's no initial capital cost for the equipment for proof of concept. So you mentioned that there's a vast array of tools. Can you give some examples? What types of tools do you have? We have electron microscopes. We have all kinds of inspection characterization equipment. But uh, more importantly, since we're a nanofab, we have ways of depositing etching and basically patterning uh, different layers of materials. Let me uh, brag a little bit about our lithography capabilities because that's actually my own area of research. So we have a production quality ASML DPUV stepper. We also have a Joel 9500 uh, e-beam tool that has uh, 10 nanometer resolution capability and uh, it's very, very heavily used and it's It's rather unique in the country. So uh, we we have some rather specialized uh, tools. We also have a broad range of etch and deposition systems, which gives us the fortunate advantage that as new materials need to come into the uh, clean room with the advent of uh, quantum devices and, and other areas of research, we have the ability to handle that. So over the, the many years that you have had this unique facility, you must have seen a lot of really interesting research. 
Can you share some of your thoughts about the success stories that you've seen emerge from your center? There's lots of cool science and nature papers and so forth, which we get all tingly about. But one of the measures is if the technology actually gets commercialized and grows and creates jobs and creates value from that original investment. And so we take a lot of pride in some of the companies that have come out of and continue to come out of CNF. One such company was Kionix. Kionix has almost gone through its life cycle, but it, it was uh, one of the largest producers of gyro chips for cell phones. It developed right out of CNF. They made these MEMS accelerometers, which were the key ingredient to these chips, built a fab or a manufacturing plant right here in Ithaca and hired many people to build those chips. And they were acquired recently by a Japanese firm. Similarly, uh, Pacific Biosciences, which is located on the West Coast, started here in Ithaca. It was a way of doing genetic sequencing that highly paralyzed the process. And so it allowed sequencing to be done much quicker. And so they originally formed that company here in Ithaca, and then the investors required it to move out and expand out in the Silicon Valley area. But that is one of the largest now suppliers of genetic sequencing equipment in the world and just was acquired for 1.2 billion oh, like that's that. right not not so bad for a 10 year old startup yeah and and so we know the people who started that they come back in fact some of them are advisors to cnf and so it's great to have that perspective and to be a uh, part of that success and we continue to launch a uh, new companies like zalant Zalant was founded by a PhD student from electrical engineering here at, at Cornell, and he recognized that often you want to check out the performance of a computer chip, even when it's fresh, before you plug it into a, a, a larger system. And so he developed a nanoprobe system that can both sit inside an electron microscope or work on the bench, and he's having some very good success with that. And it's the usual startup struggle. You have an idea, you, you figure out how to implement it, you need to make sales, and we've been trying to nurture his efforts as we do many, many startups. So I was just going to give some metrics. Uh, over the last decade, 169 different companies and over 100 colleges and universities use CNF. 34 startup companies have started at CNF over the last decade, and about 45 other small startup companies have utilized CNF for research and development and prototyping. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about nanotechnology more broadly. One of the things that we've heard through these series of podcasts is that nanotechnology research and development has become more interdisciplinary and collaborative under the umbrella of the National Nanotechnology Initiative. What are your observations? I think from the inception of, of nanoscience, people saw this convergence, this multidisciplinary effort, but I don't think they knew the scope and the impact that it was going to have. I think they dreamed of things, but uh, golly, a $1.2 billion company that comes from drilling nano holes in a substrate and, uh, and using it to separate uh, DNA fact fragments so you can sequence the genome. I don't think back 40 years ago, people imagined uh, that would be uh, possible. It combines biology, it combines physics, it combines nanoprocessing, it combines surface science, so many different uh, disciplines. I think the, the research landscape at a place like CNF is just fantastic. One of the advantages is you actually put people in a clean room space where they can go during their downtime, they can talk to each other and exchange ideas. The ability to have people from different backgrounds come together and then create a brand new science and engineering is just phenomenal. That's one of the most exciting things for me to see, just the amazing ideas that come from the users, uh, largely, the, largely the grad students. I think by the time you have a full-time job, you're not as creative. <laughs> I would just use as an example a collaboration that's occurring uh, today in the area of moats. Moats are microscale optoelectronically transduced electrodes. This is a, a group that is converging physicists who are figuring out how to take films, functional materials, fold them in kirigami and origami type fashion, 
and working with electrical engineers who can design circuits and photo detectors and transmitters and so forth, and layering all that within CNF so that we have a sandwich which both is small enough to go into live cells uninvasively, yet collect sophisticated data and transmit that data locally out of the cell. So all of that requires uh, life scientists, physicists, and uh, engineers working together to figure out uh, both the uh, fabrication and the you know, having low power devices and, uh, and the protocols for introducing these into uh, life systems. What are some of the challenges that you see facing the world that you think nanotechnology will play a role in solving? When I was a new director, I said, uh, wow, we need to think a little bit about the future. What kind of equipment is CNF going to need? What kind of skill sets do the staff need to have? And so we held a workshop and we brought in some really, really smart people from across the country. And one of the things we asked them is, what's the, what's the future going to be like? And one area that they talked about, and they just used cell phones as an example, everybody's going to have multiple computers on them. And it might be in their wristwatch, it might be in their cell phone, it might be their laptop. All of these computers need to talk to each other, and they have to talk in an intelligent fashion. The information is going to be ubiquitous, so we need to acquire, store, and move information. We see that with the buildup of the high-speed cell phone uh, networks. But that it's not going to stop there. We also have looked at the creation of self-driving automobiles that have been fairly effective so far, but I'm not ready to get one and drive around in it. But a time will come when a lot of the technical problems are sorted out and the amount of information exchange is going to be remarkable. Just thinking about the electronic side, we're going to need much more robust computing. But we need sensors and everything. We need an integrated uh, design. We talked about moats. One of the area that they're looking at is connection to neural technology. And so how are we going to interface with the human mind in ways that all of us are, are comfortable with. How are we going to use nanoscience to interact with living cells, both to heal them, but also to produce important biological chemicals? Tissue engineering will be important because we can make very small scale structures, we can make tissue scaffolds. And so building replacement parts or tissue that is needed in the case of someone's severely injured, that will grow. So I, I think it's just an incredibly exciting uh, time. Well, clearly, we have a lot that we need to do. Do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners? I just would say that if your listeners are inspired to check us out, we're here. We have uh, programs at all different levels for people who are curious to learn a little bit more. And we hope we can be part of that message with our partners at NNCI for the entire country. Thank you for joining us today for the stories from the NNI. If you would like to learn more about nanotechnology, please visit nano.gov or email us at info at nnco.nano.gov and check back here for more stories. <laughs>